we're going to be talking about leading in a culturally diverse context. So what we're going to cover is first we're going to talk about the rise and types of team diversity. And then we're going to look at re a review of some literature. What is the, some of the research telling us about diversity, types of diversity, and how whenever that diversity is engaged in a, a team, both a, a, an on-ground or a um, face-to-face team or a virtual team, how does performance vary and differ, and how can that inform the way that we attempt to form teams and work with culturally diverse teams? And then finally, I just want to give some practical considerations, some things for you to think about. I mainly want to set sort of some background information about what the research says uh, about working in culturally diverse teams. So let's start with reasons for the rise of cultural diversity in project teams. There are a few key reasons. One is, obviously, and you could have guessed this one, is increased globalization. With the globalization that's happening, we are seeing companies cross more boundaries, engage more teams from around the world, and work together in ways that wasn't happening 15, 20, 30 years ago to the degree that it's happening now. So this is really increasing the presence of cultural diversity in teams. There's simply greater workforce diversity. We see that both in, in North America, we see that overseas. We see that even if it's not our company working with a team that's overseas, just the fact that they were present in the North American workforce, we're seeing greater workforce diversity. You can look at the demographic data and see the growth of different groups, um, social categories, if you will, coming together in the workforce, creating this greater diversity. And then, of course, technological advancements. This has increased our ability to work with people from around the globe, to work with people from around even the country in North America, and it has given rise to greater diversity in, in project teams. There is also a greater need to apply diverse skill sets to complex projects and problems. Many of the projects that we undertake because of the technological advances, because of the global reach of our company, there are more complex issues, there are more complex projects, there are more complex problems. And we need diverse people uh, from a variety of backgrounds and uh, functional areas to solve these problems. And so because of the types of problems and challenging challenges that many companies are facing, they're turning to uh, building, specifically attempting to build, teams that have very diverse viewpoints and skill sets to address these. And then right along with this is the increased use of remote teams. The very fact that remote or virtual teams are becoming so, um, so used, accepted if you will, it increases this opportunity, which sort of feeds into the increased globalization, the greater workforce diversity, the technological advancements, all those things and the need to apply uh, diverse skills to complex projects and problems have increased the use of remote teams. And it's, it's almost like a cyclical thing that's feeding on itself, um, giving rise to greater cultural diversity. Now, whenever we talk about diversity, cultural diversity, I specifically have two types of diversity in mind. One is functional diversity. This is different skill sets, different working styles, uh, different backgrounds, different uh, levels of education uh, that, that people bring with their different skill sets. And so this is functional diversity. So you could have a team that is well, let's look at the next one first, social diversity. Social diversity refers to ethnicity, gender, national origin, and, and these type of demographic categories. So you could have a team that is very social diverse, but not very functionally diverse. They all have similar backgrounds, education, types of training. Or you could have a team that is functionally diverse, but not socially diverse. Or you could have a team that's obviously both functional and socially diverse. And whenever we talk about diversity, the term is not always clearly defined. So even in some of the literature that you may read in your research, you need to be careful about how they're using the term. Are they talking about functional diversity, social diversity, or even within these categories, there are more nuanced um, 
types of diversity that they may be referring to. I'm referring to both types because people from different environments, if you put a team of engineers together with a team of salespeople, there are some culturally diverse issues going on there. So we're talking about um, both types, both functional diversity and social diversity in this, in this lecture. And, and I try to distinguish between those throughout um, based on the research that we're, we're looking at and the points that we're making. So one question is, is, is why diverse teams? Why do we want um, teams that have diversity? Well, um, some of the research says that diverse teams are more likely to develop innovative solutions. If they're giving a complex problem that uh, an easy answer does not exist or a solution needs to be developed, that when you put people from diverse backgrounds together, they are more likely to be creative and innovative because they're going to come at the problem from different angles. And it's interesting, I had a mentor who uh, worked at Boeing for many years and led teams in their uh, technical area. And he told me that if he had his pick between a bunch of uh, graduate level students who all came from the same sort of uh, social background and functional background um, as one option, and then for another option, he was given people that had uh, training that was relevant to the problem, but some diversity in the training, and also they were socially diverse, he would pick that team, the second team that was both socially diverse and somewhat functionally diverse every time, he said, because they're going to be able to come at this from different angles, uh, with different lenses, perspectives, and they're more likely to, to come up with a creative solution. So uh, there is evidence that diverse teams, and we're going to talk about some of this in a minute specifically, are more likely to develop innovative solutions. And there is also some evidence to suggest that these teams can become uh, very high performing teams. And also, this is one that, that you see somewhat frequently, is there is a fear of the consequences of not having a diverse team. And by that, I don't mean legal fears. I mean competitive advantage fears, that companies fear that if they're not bringing in a multitude of perspectives, they fear they're going to miss something. And that is going to have consequences for the company. And so this is a, a viewpoint that you're going to find quite prevalent in the literature. So let's... Let's so now look at what are some of the consequences maybe of only having homogenous teams, teams where there isn't the social or the functional diversity. Well, the, the argument is, is that there is the underuse, we underuse people's skills to fuel innovation. When we don't bring together a diverse group of people, we're not going to be able to fuel innovation in the way that we could if we were. Uh, we're going to lag behind in developing um, from the global talent pool. If we aren't intentionally seeking to build these diverse teams, then we're not going to be pulling, if you will, the best people that we can find from around the globe. Some companies, as we, we just alluded to, feel that they'll lose their competitive advantage because they're going to miss something. They're, they're going to miss something that they, they could have seen had they been using diverse team. And, and the question is is, is, is all of this, is this general view of uh, diverse teams and the consequences of using homogenous teams, is this view supported by the research, by the evidence? And the answer is complex because the research is mixed and nuanced. So the answer is yes and no. It really depends on the type of project that we're talking about, the type of diversity that we're talking about, and the context in which that's going to work. Um, in. So what I want to do now is I want to look at sort of three main articles <clears throat> that pull together a lot of different research in looking at what are, what are sort of some of the benefits and what are some of the approaches that we might need to have when looking at working with diverse teams. And so the first article is by uh, David Kravitz, and you can see the full uh, information bibliographical information there at the bottom, but his article in Diversity in Teams sort of comes to these findings, um, that whenever people look at diversity and teams, uh, some people just come out with, with an optimistic view, and they tend to focus on functional diversity. 
meaning that we see the greatest value when there is functional diversity. The pessimistic view tends to focus on tenure and social categories or social diversity. So we see the greatest benefits in this article, what, what Kravitz is saying, is the research says that we see the greatest benefit when there's functional diversity, but we tend to run into some problems when there are higher levels of social diversity. And so he summarizes by saying that functional diversity tends to have a positive impact, while social diversity tends to have negative effects. And those are the conclusions, some of the conclusions and research that he draws in his, his article. So he gives three suggestions based on this. Uh, based on what he discovers. The first is, is that diverse teams are better for innovative challenges, while homogenous teams are better for implementing what is already known. And so if you do have a problem that requires a creative solution, it's sort of you're, you're going out into the unknown for your company, he says that the, the research says that diverse teams are going to be better for addressing those challenges, while if it's something that you already know and you don't need this sort of innovation and creativity, then homogenous teams tend to perform better um, in that environment. And then he gives the recommendation of that when there is a diverse team, you need to give special attention to reducing process problems, meaning you want to have a clear process for how the team's going to work together, boundaries laid out, and that reduces the type of, of stress that can arise when working with um, with people from different backgrounds, different perspectives, and different expectations. And then he said it's critically important to create an environment where minority opinions are heard um, in the team. So that's something that you want to try to build into the team structure. And so <clears throat> those are sort of the findings from, from his article. And now I want to move to another or two more articles, and then we're going to sort of try to pull that together with some practical um, points. So in, in this article, the effects of cultural diversity in virtual teams versus face-to-face -face teams, um, the two authors did some really interesting research because they looked at um, specifically how does cultural diversity play out in both virtual teams and face-to-face -face teams. And here are some of their general findings. They found that diversity creates value through increased creativity, imagination, and flexibility. So this sort of goes along with the the Kravitz article that when there is when there are these problems that need creative and innovative work that diverse teams bring the most value. Uh, they found that diverse teams tend to bring more ideas, they tend to stimulate thinking and bring different networks and this is network of contacts because they come from different backgrounds, different spheres of influence, they sort of bring those networks to bear rather than people who sort of come up through the same way and all have basically the same overlapping networks. And, and this is another finding uh, that they had, that when variety and complexity is relevant to the task, then one should expect high-level diversity to yield greater results than, homo than a homogenous team. And that's the exact same findings that, that Kravitz came to, that there, when there is this variety, when there is this complexity, this need for innovation and creativity, diverse teams will typically yield greater results than, than um, homogenous teams. And they found, and their finding is aligns with Kravitz as well, that if variety is not relevant, there's no expect, there's no basis to expect that diverse teams um, will outperform homogenous teams on those types of, of projects. So this is what I meant by sort of yes and no, that diverse teams, the evidence says that diverse teams will yield better results in certain project types, but in other project types, the, the the performance of the diverse team and the performance of the homogenous teams is basically equal. But the research goes on. They found that in face-to-face -face team where variety was not present, meaning where basically the parameters and the execution of the project were well known, the performance difference between homogenous teams and diverse teams was not statistically different, which just sort of summarizes what I just said. In face-to-face -face team, where there's not this need for creativity and for innovation, both types of teams perform all things all given all things equal. Essentially, they perform equally well. But this is a key finding: that diverse virtual teams did perform significantly better 
than diverse face-to-face -face themes. While face-to-face -face and virtual homogeneous teams perform equally well. So just to say that again, if you had a diverse team that was working in a face-to-face -face environment versus a diverse team that was working in a virtual environment, there is the expectation that the virtual team, the div virtual t diverse team, will outperform the face-to-face -face diverse team, whereas homogeneous teams perform equally well face-to-face -face and um, in the virtual environment. And, and they talk about some of the reasons that may be. They, they speculate a little bit. They don't have a, necessarily a solid answer um, for why that's the case. Um, but it is an interesting finding, especially relevant to us talking about this idea of remote and virtual teams, that whenever you move a diverse team into the remote and virtual environment, they tend to outperform if in, compared to if they were working together face to face. So one more article that I want to look at on conflict and cooperation in diverse work groups to sort of round out this research. And this is what, what the, these authors found, that whether productive or destructive, diverse teams are more likely to experience conflict than homogenous teams. And that makes sense. People come from different backgrounds. They have different expectations, different cultural norms and standards. And so when they come together and they sort of bring that, um, those varying perspectives together, we expect there to be a learning curve for people to understand how people are thinking and work together and address problems or challenges or communicate. But the research also indicates that homogenous and diverse teams can be equally or unequally cooperative, meaning that if it's a diverse team, it doesn't mean that there's going to be more conflict necessarily or less cooperation. It really comes down to how the team is set up. And what's really interesting is these, the, these authors looked at a lot of other research that was out there. Um, and they came to the conclusion that the findings about diverse and homogenous teams is often conflicting and incomplete, meaning you can read one article that says, oh, diverse teams are the best for this, and another one that says that homogenous teams are the best for this, and then you can find another article that says the exact opposite of that that's, that's been uh, researched. And, and there's evidence to point to that direction based on studies. So how do we pull all this together? Well, there are some key findings. I, I think some generalities that can be applied uh, overall. Some diverse teams outperform homogenous teams and others do not. It's, it's that simple. The evidence points in both directions. There tends to be more evidence to suggest that if it's a complex problem of where there's variety, complexity, that diverse teams will do better. And even then, um, virtual diverse teams will outperform face-to-face -face, um, diverse teams. But it's, it doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. Diverse teams and homogenous teams face varying levels of conflict and cooperation. They can be um, as equally uh, cooperative or they can be as equally conflicted. But there is one finding, is that diverse virtual teams seem to perform better than diverse face-to-face -face teams, which I, I think is a key point. And so I don't think there are any simple answers or solutions to there's no formula, if you will, for how teams should be formed. Team formation does not ensure success or failure. So whether you think your team's not diverse in us, or your team is um, too diverse, or, or whatever the, the thinking may be, that is not going to ensure success or failure. Rather, the leadership approach is more influential than team formation. How someone works with the people they have and how they create an environment to bring people together to address the problem, I think, is more indicative of success or failure, for that matter, than the makeup of the team. So good leadership that seeks to understand people, understand the need to work with people in a way that allows them to, if you will, find their place and their stride within the team is going to be a bigger influencer of success than merely the formation of the team, whether there's functional diversity or social diversity or whatever the case may be. So where do we go? 
I want to look at just a few practical suggestions. And in the reading, you're going to find a lot of sort of practical thoughts about working with remote and virtual teams this week. So the first one is, is we need to be ready, willing, and able to adapt to the needs of the team and the project. We may have a way that we sort of like running projects, that we like running meetings or communicating or different things of that nature. We need to be prepared to adapt to the needs of our teammates and for the greater good of the project. So whenever we go into a project, we need to begin filling those things out to try to decide what's the best way to navigate based on the needs of the team. We need to promote awareness, acceptance, and engagement. We need to um, not push these things to the side, but try to understand them so that we can engage more fully, so that we can understand and ensure that there is an environment where people feel comfortable fully engaging in the work of the project and offering their input in a way that they're not concerned about the way that it's going to be received. We need to be careful to not misinterpret behaviors. There is um, some interesting research and writing on this specifically, and it sort of centers around this idea that oftentimes, one of the examples that I saw is, is that um, you know, if someone comes to the, uh, the team and they're really quiet, then we might assume that they are disengaged, they don't want to offer their opinion. However, it may be in their sort of cultural makeup or background where they don't think that it's right to speak up when there is a superior who allegedly has more knowledge than they do. So there's, there's all sorts of ways that we can misinterpret behavior, and so we need to be careful to um, if we see a behavior and we think it's disruptive or it doesn't make sense to us or it's uncooperative or it's not um, putting forth the effort that we think, that we may need to not make a judgment about that based on our cultural viewpoint, but we need to go to the person and sort of try to understand why they're behaving the way they are and to see if it's just a cultural misunderstanding. And this is a another point, and it's... It's so critical that we're aware of our own situatedness. We are situated in the world in a particular place, in a particular time, in a particular context, based on the way that we've been raised, based on our, our family, on the things that we've been exposed to, and it makes us blind to, people, blind to certain things where other people come from other backgrounds and have, if you will, a different situatedness. And so if we are sort of aware of what our cultural expectations are, realizing that they are cultural um, oftentimes, then it makes us more ready to see the diversity and accept the diversity of others and to engage with them in a way that is productive. And, and finally, just become a student of culture. Try to understand the, the cultural, the norms, the backgrounds of the different people that you work with in a way that, um, that, that just wants to understand it so that you can appreciate it and so that you can engage more fully with those people, understanding where they're coming from and the and the, the varying work styles or communication styles and expectations. Um, I, I find this um, fascinating. I've had the opportunity to, to do work uh, globally in a few different countries, and I find it you know, before I go and before I engage as much as possible, I try to read as much as I can and to chat with as many people as I can who've worked there or people who grew up there so that um, I understand what the expectations are so that as best as I'm able, I'm able to adapt my style and maybe my preferences, which are, are not right or wrong, they're just preferences, to the needs of that culture in that context. And if we want to be successful leading culturally diverse teams, we are going to have to become a student of cultures. We're going to have to, if you will, um, as much as we're able to back out of our expectations and norms and be willing to accept and work with other people on their terms, um, but in a way that accomplishes the work of the project. Uh, so as you're doing the reading this week, as you're um, uh, thinking through the assignment, the case study that you have, um, hopefully you'll find this helpful, 
and um, hopefully you'll be able to begin thinking about ways that you can engage more proactively and productively when working in a diverse cultural context. As always, if you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to email me, and I shall be happy to, to answer you as soon as I can. Thanks so much. <music>